Hello and welcome to today's event, Creating a Talent Development Culture in State and Local Government. This is Julia Burroughs. I'm the Director of the Governing Institute, which works to advance great state and local government through research, webinars such as this, and live events. I'm excited to serve as today's moderator, and I thank you so much for joining us. We have folks on the line from across the country, and I know we're in an, for an informative session over the next 60 minutes. Before we begin, a couple of brief housekeeping notes. First, a recording of this presentation will be emailed to all registrants within the next two days. You can use the recording for your reference or you can forward along to colleagues. The webcast is designed to be interactive and you can participate in question and answer with us by asking questions at any time during the presentation. You should see a Q&A box on the bottom left of the presentation panel. So just send your questions as they come up throughout the presentation by typing them into the panel. Our speakers will address as many of these questions as we can during the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you'd like to download a PDF of the slides of this presentation, you can do so by clicking the Webinar Resources widget at the bottom of the console. And there's some great information, so I highly encourage you to do that. And also during today's webinar, we encourage you to connect with your peers via LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. We use hashtag GovLive to share what you are learning via Governing's Twitter platform. And we also watch that to see what the highlights according to our audience might be. At the close of the webinar, we encourage you to complete a brief survey about our presentation. We'd love to hear what you think. If you're unable to stay with us for the entire webinar but would like to complete the survey, please click the survey widget at the bottom of the screen to launch the survey. Otherwise, it will pop up once the webinar concludes. So at this time, we recommend you disable your pop-up blockers, and if you are experiencing any media player issues or have any other problems, you can just click the Help button and someone will come on the line. So today our agenda includes a welcome and I'll introduce our speakers. And we'll also cover with our two fabulous speakers um, several topics related to talent development culture in state and local government. And that includes um, various challenges that our speakers have seen that we've seen here at Governing. We'll also hear about making the business case for investment in talent development. Often that can be the first thing that's trimmed or cut during budget uh, issue. We'll hear a case study from Dr. Trish Holliday on Tennessee's culture of high performance. And we'll hear about solutions for creating a talent development culture. And we encourage you again to type in questions because there will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So we encourage you to let us know what you're thinking. Today's featured speakers, we have two fabulous speakers, Dr. Trish Holliday. She's the Assistant Commissioner and State Chief Learning Officer for the Department of Human Resources in the state of Tennessee, and John Yamas, the Principal for Thought Leadership and Advisory Services for Cornerstone On Demand. Dr. Trish Holliday is a pioneer, and she's a great friend of governing. Tennessee was the first state in the U.S. to establish an executive position of Chief Learning Officer. And Dr. Holliday was appointed to this role, so she's the first ever chief learning officer for any state in the country. She fosters a culture that promotes engagement, encourages retention, and provides continuous learning and leadership development for all the employees that are lucky enough to work for the state of Tennessee. Dr. Holliday is an adult educator, and she's an executive coach, and in a previous life served as a full-time minister in Tennessee, so you'll hear, you'll hear that in her voice, that passion for people. She's won numerous national and state awards, including this year, the International Public Management Association Award for Human Resources, called the Warner Stockburger Achievement Award for her lifetime of outstanding contributions to improve public HR management. We are very lucky at Governing to have Dr. Holliday as a frequent speaker, and she speaks for a host of other organizations, so we welcome Dr. Trish Holliday. Also joining us is John Yamas. He's the Principal, Thought Leadership and Advisory Services for Cornerstone, a great partner of Governing. John has 35 years of experience in HR and IT business and consulting, and he's worked for multinational corporations on a variety of verticals. 
He has great experience and focus on HR transformation, business growth and expansion in finance. And he's worked for a number of companies, um, and we know that you can only expand a company, especially across national lines, if you care for your people. So he's had experience at Deloitte, Victoria's Secret, PwC, and Kaiser Health, and John is based in North Carolina. So we have a Tennessean and a North Carolinian on the call today with great experience in leading a culture for people. Um, here at Governing, we track this issue of talent and culture development because it is a top issue um, in leading and providing service for residents and businesses. We hear in surveys and we follow academic and workforce institutions that recognize it is critical to make government an employer of choice in order to best serve the residents. And both Dr. Holliday and John have established cultures for t talent development. And so Dr. Holliday will hear from you first on this critical issue and how best to address that amongst state and local government across the country. So Dr. Holliday, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I am so glad to be here, and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. John and I are excited to be here because this is truly a passion of both of ours, and so I, I wanted to kickstart it with just some initial research from ATD. As we look at that, you'll see that in 2015, some of the global trends in talent development started to emerge, and ATD captured some of it. And one of the things I thought would be interesting for us and all our folks in the audience, we are not alone. So this is a global concern. This is a global challenge. And when we look at what we're trying to do in local and state government, it's important to see where in North America the top three biggest challenges, what they were. And, and as I noted, wow, I looked across this research all across the globe, everybody put the number one challenge they were having, building a culture that supports development initiatives. We always talk about here in the state of Tennessee how important it is to create a learning culture, and that takes not just saying, let's be a learning culture. It really does take executives saying, this is important. How do we get the administration at the top, how do we get our peers, how do we get all different levels within an organization to understand that continuous improvement is important and specifically in, gate, in government when we're, we're actually the protectors of our citizens' resources, making sure that we are efficient and effective Becoming a learning organization is something that's really, really critical. And I thought this was an interesting piece of research or, or statistic that came out by Deloitte. It, it says that companies with strong learning cultures lead to 30 to 50 percent higher engagement and retention rates. Eighty percent of employees feel learning new skills would make them feel more engaged. So I think we're talking today about a very holistic challenge that we all need to, one, understand there's some urgency around this, because collectively, if we can all start creating these learning cultures and, and creating a culture where people want to be a part of it, want to better themselves and what they're contributing, I think all boats rise. The other thing I thought that was neat, not just that we're not alone in this challenge and have similar challenges across the world, but I thought it was interesting that in North America, leveraging technology for learning really emerged as one of our top three biggest challenges. So I'm hoping that as we talk today, we can look at the importance of technology, how to use technology in a variety of ways, and understanding that Together, we can solve some, some really great solutions. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to how we unpack this as we go through our conversation today. And, and bottom line, John and I both are interested in not just talking about the challenges and seeing what the research says, but we're hoping 
like all our participants in the audience, let's, let's leave this conversation with some action, with some tangible ways that we can apply what we've heard, what we see, how we've listened to the conversation, where we could actually go out and really begin to change some of the things that we're doing to impact it in a positive way. I'm going to turn it over to John so that he can kick into this conversation, and then we're going to hit it hard. John, are you, you're up. Thank you, Dr. Holliday. And uh, I simply want to echo your sentiments and your passion around this particular topic. It's, uh, it's always been something that has driven my interest in my career, the, the combination of culture and the individuals that comprise it, and the impact of technology in there. And I'm specifically leaning that to the back end because a lot of times we'll see these type of efforts around transformation focusing on technology as opposed to what's really important. And I think I'd like to start framing this up a bit in terms of what's really important. And that's the new employees in this new economy. And they're bringing in a lot of different expectations. Part of it as a result of the workforce having multi um, ages working it, we have many different, as many as five generations in the workforce right now. Much of it being influenced by the millennials, uh, which I think are receiving some unjust uh, um, troubles and kudos. I mean, everybody's experiencing it. But the one thing that we've noticed and we've seen the research and it's really borne out is that the expectations are bringing out a lot of new challenges around continuous lifelong learning. That's clearly one of the strongest things that we're seeing and obviously very important to, to development. Also, they're looking for empowered career development, and it's not necessarily the staid old way that they used to uh, develop your career, which was generally, at least in the consulting experience that I've had, it was an up or out kind of process. And we're seeing a much more diffused and much different approach around career development, and part and parcel has to do, again, with the way that work is changing, and thus a re-influencing for continuous lifelong learning. When we look at some of the research, we understand that the skills that brought many of us here uh, aren't going to be around much longer. The half-life of a lot of skills is, is nearing about five years. So we see the need to continuously understand what's the work in front of us and what are the skill sets that we need to do, bring about, and how do we weave that in, not only in terms of a career, but how do we, how do we weave that in with performance, the real-time performance right now? One of the things we're all recognizing is this need for consistent, regular, and continuous feedback. And our performances are really moving towards that way. I know that there's a trend to do away with annual and even quarterly performances the way that we all grew up, experienced them. And now it's in the moment, right after, clearly what can we learn, what can we take away, what did we succeed at, and what could we do better. And those are things that are very important to this uh, workforce now. And finally, contextual intelligent talent decisions. People want to see transparency, they want to see fairness, and they want to understand how things are decided upon and how they can participate most effectively in doing that. And so thinking about these new expectations of the worker also brings about a new way of thinking of talent. And I'll, just a very quick example is you see the old way, the old command and control structures that many of us grew up in. You were in a department, you stayed in that department, you learned the skills that were very narrowly defined within that particular channel. Um, and, and that's the way you progress. You got better and better. But what we're seeing today is a breakout of that. In fact, it's not even the same structure. We've gone more to a economy and a workforce that needs to collaborate, that needs to get out of these particular silos and work at any place, anywhere, with anybody, bringing in expertise, bringing in technology, bringing in their knowledge and experience, 
And we have to continually support that. And this has to come from executive management, top management. But these are the things that we're facing today in terms of culture, in terms of process, and in terms of technology. And so I think that's, Dr. Holliday, I wanted to just kind of provide that framework. And I'll turn it back over to you to see how we might translate that into certain things within state and local government and how similar it is to, to your point is that this is a global issue around what businesses and government uh, need to accomplish. So I'll give it back to you. Thank you so much. And, and I wanted to take that framework and unpack it in these particular five areas. So when we look specifically in local state government, I always begin with what am I hearing? What, what are people telling me? And these are really the five categories people keep coming to me with their greatest challenges. I, uh, I am reminded that really a, when we talk about this whole talent development challenge, we have to remember the philosophy behind which we are really driving this cultural movement. And, and it is, it's, centered on this idea of employees have to own their own development. And so if we can create a culture, and I, and I talk about what a learning organization is, there's, a, there's all kinds of great resources um, out there really talking about it from Peter Singe's Fifth Discipline to Holly Burkett. Dr. Burkett wrote a book called Learning for the Long Run, and in it she really says, if you want to be a learning organization, here's what you need to concentrate on. And amazingly enough, it helps us look at these five categories, attract and retain talent, minimize knowledge loss, accelerate leadership development, keep up with the pace of change, and improve performance at a multi-generational level. And I get, the first thing I get is, Trish, we don't have any money. And, and so we're in government. We, this is the first thing that gets cut. And, and what I'd like to do is challenge the status quo thinking on that. I'd really like to disrupt our thinking and say, let's approach this from a new perspective. So one, if we're talking about attracting and retaining talent, one, we have to make sure we're recruiting for the right talent. And we also know that in recruiting, people do not want to be a part of a culture that has complacency, that is at a status quo uh, existence, where people are not always looking to improve and become more effective. Again, that supports the business case of creating a culture that's a learning organization where employees are constantly looking to share with each other. They're seeking out new knowledge. And this isn't the burden of the leader. This is actually bringing talent in who want to contribute to the greater good. And that's what we've got going for us in government. I am a public sector geek. I think it's amazing um, <laughs> when, when you get people together and we talk about, oh, my goodness, we have such a cause and we can do such good. And if we invite the right talent to participate in that, then all boats rise. Again, not just attracting them, but how are we going to keep them? And Daniel Pink says in his book, Drive, there are three things we need to be sure, if we really want to keep top talent around, three things we need to pay attention to. One, everybody wants mastery in their craft, which means we got to help develop people. we got to understand what their career goals are, and we got to bring that alive. Everybody wants a purpose, and this is where I think government has the competitive edge. And I do believe we can be, to Julia's point earlier, an employer of choice. And I really want government leaders to hear this third one because people want autonomy. And that means they don't want to be micromanaged and being a part of a culture that is layered with bureaucracy and approval after approval and red tape. People feel like they don't have a voice inside the culture. But we know that if we can think differently and give and empower people to have decisions at the lowest level, we are really going to engage them in a new way. 
Now, one of the challenges you'll notice on the screen says keep up with the pace of change. I actually had a, a leader come to me and say, Doc Holliday, when are you going to stop changing things? And I thought that was <laughs> one, like, really, you're asking me this question? And then two, I just came back with, never? And and I think the answer really shocked them because the idea was, wait a minute, change is what we're living in. We're moving at the at warp speed and trying to accomplish so much and get so much done for the citizen that we have to pay attention to how are we evolving inside our own organizations. Now, we do know that in this multi-generational workforce, we have the largest workforce by 2020 will be the millennials. And they are expected to exceed a third of the workforce. I mean, that's a that's a pretty startling statistic. So maybe we should stop talking about generations and talk about how we all begin to coexist and work together. And um, I, I do some separate things on the side in this whole multi-generational realm. And I get people to think differently about it because I want us to quit labeling folks and I want to quit licensing certain behavior based on a generational stereotype. And then the third one is, I think if we quit labeling, we quit, we quit licensing certain behaviors, then we will stop limiting people. Because I do believe when we label people, they get limited. And so in, in, as we address these talent development challenges in government, I want us to think about how can we all come together and contribute at a much much higher level. And and I look at that with what we're doing in the state of Tennessee. And I like talking about what has worked and also some lessons learned of where along the way, if we've learned some hard lessons, how we might could share that with our audience so that you too could benefit from what we've learned and what didn't go well, how we overcame these particular challenges in and how we built this platform that we're calling a learning organization inside the state government. We're at first, and John, I don't know, I don't know about you, but I mean, people don't even believe me when I say we really are becoming a learning organization, and it seems to be like a surprise in the government culture. Have you ever, have you ever <laughs> heard that or yeah. seen that? Uh, I have seen that reaction, and it is patently false. I mean, it is something that I think everyone that is a leader and anyone that's leading an organization recognizes it has to come about. There is no other way. Um, a learning organization, I think, has some implications about what we talked about, what you talked about earlier in terms of attracting the right people. And as you were walking through this thought of the self-directed learner, and yeah. flourishing within a an environment that doesn't just uh, enable it but demands it, and I think that's where we're we're seeing things go. And that that is one of the things that many of the millennials that are coming in talk about in terms of what's important to them. It's not yeah. necessarily making money, but it's doing something with meaning. And how do you do that? How do you continually do that? And so I'm yeah. tracking right with you. Yeah, and, and I, one of the things that, that I think is important in this conversation is whatever we we have done in Tennessee state government, it started with our governor. And then it started from from our governor who said, we want to invest in our workforce. Now, I've heard it say, you know, people are our greatest asset. Philosophically, I come to the table thinking a little bit differently. I think people are our greatest investment because an investment grows, an asset actually depreciates. And so if we think about people as an investment and then why wouldn't we want our workforce to be at their best? And how can we help them get there? If the, if the workforce feels that the leadership, the administration says, yes, this is important, then I guarantee you we increase 
the number of employees who will take it upon their own initiative to learn more, become more effective, become more efficient in how they're contributing to the organization. Some of the things we did in Tennessee state government is we said we need a unified approach because we have 23 cabinet agencies and inside that you could think maybe there's 23 miniature businesses operating in silos. But what's happened and what we've seen in the last eight years here in, in the state is this holistic approach to government where now we're sharing resources across agency lines. Now we're making sure that we're aligned in our strategy on how we're managing performance, how we holding people accountable. We're also very aligned and unified in what people are learning. And we want it to be evidence-based. And so we created an integrated talent management system that had 10 talent management practices that are all mapped to core competencies and mapped to evidence-based learning. I did share that, so that is a resource that you all will be able to see the Tennessee Talent Management Wheel and the 10 practices that are associated with it because what we found is a mature organization understands you can't just do leadership development. You can't just do performance management. You can, if you want true succession planning, you've got to get in touch with your high potential leaders. One of the things we've discovered in Tennessee is it's really important to put people in supervisory roles that actually want to lead people. Nothing worse than saying you have a bunch of supervisors who are leading people who don't like people. So, and a lot of times we'll promote somebody who's technically great at what they do but you know what's missing is, is the love for developing others. And so we've put a big concentration on the importance of developing others. And you'll see the strategy around that was that we had to figure out, one, how do we distribute, develop leadership? How do we make sure we're not just developing and concentrating on the top of the house? But how are we empowering that frontline supervisor to be the best supervisor they can be where they are? I sometimes think of the supervisor population as the forgotten population. This is that middle, middle manager. They're not sitting at the very top, and they're, they're, they've got employees underneath them. And, and I think they have the toughest job, and we have got to care for them in a way that I think equips them to be successful. And so what we've done is put together this learning portfolio that actually supports our supervisors and it gives them the skills they need. As, and I attach that as one of my uh, additional tools in the toolkit. It's the four level certificate program for supervisors and leaders. And, and what we've learned is the feedback's been Thank you. It's long overdue. I got promoted to be a supervisor and didn't really know what I was doing. So we've taken a step back and said, hmm, we, that really needs to be our concentration. And, you know, in government, we share, which is beautiful about being in the public sector because we can share with each other and help each other, even across county lines, city lines, state lines. And so I would love to be able to uh, – to help anybody that's interested. It's not about money. It's about bringing together these tools, these workshops that equip supervisors with the skill sets they need. And we've already developed them. So it's not even like you have to go out and start at ground zero. We've got a great portfolio that we'll be glad to share. And, and understanding that it's how do, we, how do we teach our supervisors to then not just be effective with their downline, but how do we help supervisors be effective with their upline? So how do they communicate up? How do they tell the truth to power? These are all skill sets that we're trying to help equip our supervisors with inside state government. Now, one of the things we notice, and this slide just is, is a highlight of some of the research out there that, that really does point to you got to have top 
buy-in. The top folks in the organization have to say this is important. If you want to become a learning organization, you got to have the top executive saying it. I'll never forget, we were at Lead Tennessee, it was one of our summits, and Governor Haslam has never missed a time to be with the leaders that we're developing in one of our programs called Lead Tennessee. And he comes and he's talking to the group and, I, and I'm sitting over with Commissioner Hunter over to the side and he says, well, and I'm really proud that the state of Tennessee is becoming a learning organization. I thought I was going to just slip out of my chair <laughs> or I wanted to go up and just give him this gigantic hug because all of a sudden, like when, when your top executive says it, when Commissioner Hunter says it as the chief human resource officer for the state, when you've got your top leaders, your other commissioners and other agencies saying learning is at the heartbeat of what we want to be about, then the momentum picks up. And that means we're getting the executive sponsorship that we need. I have so many people say, I, we could just never do that. We could never do that. Our leaders don't support it. So here's the secret. Here's, here's the secret of what we did. If we build a program, we build a program with the executives. They help create it. They choose what we're studying. It becomes something they're invested in. And here's also what we know. When people build it, they support it. And so it doesn't get cut from the budget. It doesn't get dismissed because if you have executive sponsorship, you have people who are saying, this is important, I'm invested in this, and I want my people to become the best version of themselves possible. And so we really are proud of how our executives in state government have not only supported it, but they've helped build all the different programs that we have and they sponsor it. When in the governor's office, we have the chief operating officer, Greg Adams, who will go up to a supervisor and will say, hey, what level on, what level on the uh, pyramid are you? Are you a level one, level two, level three? And when the chief operating officer for the governor's team says that to a supervisor, Think about the power behind that, the message behind that. And so now it's widespread. The importance of it is critical. And that's what we've got to do is show the value of learning because it gets cut when it seems it is fluff. But when it's core to what the business needs, that means the leaders are saying, here's what I want my people to learn. Then now you're teaching people what the leaders want, they're not cutting that because they're going to see the return on investment immediately with that. And as we continue, Dr. Holliday, this, yeah, I just wanted to to if you go back a little bit because I wanted to bring in some experience here as well in terms of the necessity and the criticality of having your executives in a leadership position. Um, as we try to innovate in much of what we're doing today is around innovation. Things get very complex. There's a lot. Innovation causes uh, conflict, and you need a leader who's clear in terms of the messaging that can lead the change, manage that complexity. And I, I agree. When you noted that it was three of five um, had it, I can tell you probably 95% of the projects that I've been involved in that did not achieve their end goal was because the executive was not there. And, and that is a number one thing. So I'm glad to hear you say that. And it's very similar in government as it is out in the private sector. No difference. And, and see, I love that. I love that piece too, John, because, and I think that's important what you say, because so many times it's like, no, we're not like the private sector. You know, we're public sector. But if we begin to think, wait a minute, we're in competition with the private sector for talent. So we have to create a culture that's going to attract people that are going to get people in to the public sector, even if it doesn't, even if it means they're not making the same amount they might make in the public sector. I'm telling you, cause can beat out that financial difference. If we truly create a culture that people feel like they're heard, they're contributing, 
just this morning, I met with over 100 project managers in Tennessee. Uh, I was, uh, I, I met with them. We had we had time to talk about, as a community of project managers in state government, what's the number one thing people want in your workplace? And, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I'll use that today. I told them they would all be stars because I would talk about them on this, <laughs> on this national good. webinar. But, but what was amazing is they said, Trish, people want a voice in the decision making. They want to feel like that they're contributing to something bigger than themselves. And that's how we stay competitive. You know, that's how we, we attract people uh, in, in, in this kind of climate, especially with a low unemployment rate. We got to work hard at this and we've got to have commitment across the, across the board. I, I visited several states who are wanting to really send a message to their workforce. We don't want to keep doing what we've always been doing just because we've been doing it. And I love that mm -hmm. attitude because it says that everybody understands in order for us to stay relevant, in order for us to be really, truly valued from a citizen's perspective, then we've got to have talent that care about the services and the quality that they're delivering. If the slide that the audience is looking at right now shows all of our different programs that we are doing inside state, Tennessee state government to advance this learning culture. Now, I do think it's important to note we took the 70-20-10 model and the, our approach in building this portfolio was one, understanding that 70% of an employee's knowledge is gained from job-related experiences. So we've got to create work environments where people are learning on the job. You know, they're doing things with their colleagues, they're invited to different task forces, committees, project teams that are helping them learn more and more about the, the business. Isolating people in cubicles or uh, you know, keeping them just heads down, keeping focused on just what they're doing, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, promote that learning environment that people are wanting to be a part of. And then we also know that 20% of our approach is tied to the interactions with other people, which is why when you're looking at the screen, you see all of these different programs you see Lead Tennessee, which is an application-based program. I put that in the toolkit for our audience because I wanted them to see what is happening in that particular program. We've got people who are applying to be a part of something that, that, that means they're going to get a coach for a year. They're going to be with other agency leaders, so it's across agency lines. And I'm telling you, the networking that's occurring in these programs is absolutely phenomenal. And I have people stop me every day saying, if I hadn't been in this program, I wouldn't have known about this opportunity. And so 20% of our portfolio is really dedicated to building those interactions with people across agency lines. And then the, the final 10% that we focus on is making sure that we are teaching theoretical evidence-based learning, not somebody's opinion. And we're making sure that the curriculum we're offering is highly vetted, it is best in class, so that our employees are learning the, the most relevant information that keeps them competitive in their roles. And that's the pyramid that you see on the, on the screen, the four-level certificate program. We just won a national award for this from the National Association for State Personnel Executives on its award for innovation in HR because of how we set this up for our supervisors. The, the level one, uh, which is blue on the pyramid, the, the first blue block, those are all of the mandatory required classes. So if I have 8,643 supervisors in my scope, then I'm, I'm making sure that all of them are trained in that level one with all those learning modules. But here's what's amazing is level two, three, and four, so that's advanced management, fundamental leadership, and advanced leadership skills, that's people's own initiative. And so now we're seeing this huge 
bolt of momentum with people self initiating their own learning. And that's pretty exciting. Finally, Dr. Holliday, question about, yeah. question about that yeah. in terms of the curriculum and the courses. We're hearing a lot today around learning content, particularly curated, whether that be human or machine curated learning to allow for the variability and the specificity that is going to be required because not everybody learns the same way or learns through right. you know, visual or auditory. Or, how are you seeing that affect your program uh, today versus when you started it, if any? What we're seeing is we've got to make sure we have a variety. We, uh, I, I am a still a staunch believer that people need to roll their sleeves up with one another face to face and work out mm -hmm. case studies look at scenarios and actually have that discussion around significant learning content. But I also believe there's a, a place for micro learning, those quick snippets of, of what's important. Mm -hmm. Hey, don't forget this. And then we've got our e-learning platform, which we're adding more and more of those just for supervisors to be, get, be able to go in, grab what they need, learn what they need, and then they can use it on the spot. But when we built this, we had a, a statewide task force that we put together that invited, here, what do people need to know where you are? Now, I know that sounds risky because so many of us just want to say, here's what, you, here's what we think you need to know. But I'm telling you, when I, when I um, started listening to what other people said they need their supervisors to know, one, I discovered there was a lot of similarity across the state. And then, two, we were able to build something that people automatically started championing because guess what? What we built was what they had asked for. And so there was just immediate, you know, there's so much support from the beginning. And I have a quick slide that says um, – best practices for building change capabilities. These are, the, these are the six things we paid attention to as we started through this cultural transformation. And they're the six most important things. And the last one, measure and monitor progress. Anytime you're doing any kind of change, if you don't announce those early victories quickly, people don't see the success soon enough. So that is a really big deal and something that we really worked hard on. And teaching people how to pivot was really critical, especially as we, we started saying we want to be an employer of choice. And people looking at us like, no, government can never be an employer of choice. But, but we really had to increase a different like increase the opportunity of people believing that we could actually become become a, 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 an employer of choice. And I like this slide because it shows our dedication to making sure we're having the right conversations with our employees. We meet with our employees. Every supervisor is required at least four times a year to meet with our employees, which that means at a minimum, we have, we're enabling 160,000 performance conversations annually. And our governor loves to talk about that because we've created a place where we are, employees should know, and by every 90 days, they're checking, how are you doing on your goals? How are you meeting your metrics? So again, this has just been a great way for us to say we're growing and developing. John, I'll hand it over to you to kind of give us a wrap up. Okay. Uh, and this is a wrap up that looks a bit at technology, but I'm glad that we put it at the end because everything you talked about in terms of culture, in terms of practice, in terms of people, that's what it really comes down to. And once you've got a strategy around that, much like you developed for the state of Tennessee, then you can start thinking about, well, how do we enable this? And that's really what technology should be looked at. It's an enabler. It's not the driver. The driver is what you see here is the personalized experience. We talked about that earlier. The persona, the ideas of, of really design thinking, the moments that matter. And so what we're trying to do as we constantly go through these things is put the right kinds of tools in the hands of the individuals, in the hands of the managers, and in the hands of executives, 
so that we can get things done, we can get things documented, we can look at the data and do analysis and make some informed decisions that tie back to what you mentioned earlier in terms of having impact. And so these are the platforms that we're seeing, and you can see that in recruiting and learning performance. HR administration, I think, is something that completes the platform, but it's not really the focus any longer. It really is around talent and bringing that yeah. talent in, engaging them, learning, developing, taking their skills higher, taking them to a point of collaboration, and then performance, and it's ongoing performance. It's not that, again, that annual review. It's in the moment, it's as needed, and it's constant feedback. And so these are things that you all talked about. These are things you need to look at uh, from a technology standpoint, but don't lose sight of what the real objective is, and it's making people achieve their potential. Yeah, so I think that, I love that. that's the wrap-up I'd like to put in. Yeah, I, I love that, and I, and I think, Julia, I, I think we're John and I both are ready for questions if you are. I know we've got some in the queue, and we just want to save enough time for that. But I, I, what I loved about our conversation today is that everything is so aligned, and it points to it's not like this is all over the place. I mean, it's a very concise package of first understand who you want to be and how do we get that culture to really focus on becoming the learning organization that people are attracted to so we can get the right people into government. Yes, and thank you both. That was such a great conversation. We do have a number of questions. Um, and before we start the questions, we've had a couple on both the presentation slides and the toolkit. So everyone who registered will be emailed the presentation slides within 48 hours. And the toolkit that Dr. Holliday is referring to with all of the resources that she sent in advance is available by clicking on Webinar Resources widget. It's on the bottom of the screen, and it's a little green widget with a paper icon. So you can access the toolkit. But we've got questions from all over the country. Um, I'm looking at Berrien County, Houston, the state of Maryland, Minnesota, Los Angeles, Napa, Somerset County, and comments from South Dakota. So thank you all for dialing in. And we're going to start with one on what type of training, learning, or certifications would you recommend for a local government employee who's new to the talent development role? So, Dr. Holliday, you're training the trainer here. Um, it's a yeah. new role for this person's organization, and so she's starting from scratch, and we'd love to hear where to start. What's, what's the call to action? What's the first step? Yeah, I appreciate that question, and it's really funny. I uh, I love certifications, and so I and somebody said one time, uh, we're just going to put the whole alphabet behind uh, your name at some point, and it's really to <laughs> me, I just, I just want so much out there, right? And and what else I love about this is if you're new in the role, the International Public Management Association is a great place for local government employees, state government employees, and even federal government employees to find the kind of resources they need. We just published it. I was part of a research team with the international organization where we, we uh, published an HR 2020 white paper. And we did research on the most important areas that HR – and that talent management really needs to focus on in government and with and that white paper has taken off and you'll find that on the international public management website the hr 2020 uh, executive report and it's got some great insights it's a great place to start it gives you i think the framework to create your own approach very good. That's an excellent resource, and we'll add that to the toolkit as well. So the next question is um, a conversation on limited budgets. And so how much did you invest on the Pyramid Program, Dr. Holliday, and the numerous training modules? Um, for a mid-sized state, um, you know, what was your budget for that, and what's the size of the team that's dedicated? And I think this goes to that business case for return on investment. How much have you invested there in the state of Tennessee? Yeah. Yeah, what's really important is that we we went out and did the research. I have a team of about 20, 
and we serve a workforce of 43,000 employees. We have three branches of government, and all three branches of government will participate in our learning platform. Um, and only the executive branch in state government, ha you know, is we are their resource. But what's so great is when the other two branches see what's happening and they call up and say, hey, we want to do this too. We want to do this too. I've got applications from all of those uh, branches of government wanting to participate. One of the things that I realized, though, is we we can't buy generic curriculum. We have got to create curriculum that is specific to government and specific to the needs of, the, of whatever is happening in our state. We did a big movement to become a customer-focused government. And with that, the invitation was, Trish, we need, we need some customer service training. And of course, there's thousands of customer service. Um, there's content out there galore. But I didn't want to buy some generic content. So I have a group of developers on the team that are part of, of, of our internal staff. We all build our content, which means that you don't have to have money. And the other thing is if we've built it, we can share it, which is what I would love to do with anybody that's interested. Uh, I'd be glad to, to, to share what we've done. But part of the investment was to be able to show value and relevancy. See, people don't mm -hmm. care how many people, People didn't care how many people attended. What they wanted to see was, did our great customer service training differentiate from other trainings where people thought they could behave differently? And then did they actually behave differently? So we set up metrics where, which I can take back and show the governor, show Commissioner Hunter. I can say, here is the impact we're making. So I've got testimonials. I've got the data that supports it that says, you know, we're sitting at 94% relevancy of our content that we're teaching. And if I can get that kind of return, then any business person would say that's worth whatever I'm doing to send somebody to class to, um, to offer that for my employees to get better. Now, here's what's funny. Somebody, when we started this great customer service movement, because we wanted to become customer-focused government, that I had an employee call and say, Trish, I took ser customer service training 10 years ago. Does that mean I have to take it now? And that's when I knew our work was cut out for us. <laughs> and, John, do you want to comment on, on that as well, you know, whether it's customized um, and what solutions might be available to, to folks who are researching that right now? I think it depends on each individual organization, uh, government agencies. I think there is a place for canned uh, content, but I do agree with Dr. Holliday that some of the most effective are things that are developed formally and informally. We're seeing a lot of capability developed out in the field where people really know how to do something. You know, in this day of YouTube, they'll go out and make a quick two-minute, three-minute video that really imparts how to get things done. So under the right context, the right situations, I think that informal learning content is going to become just as important. But I think there's a place for both. Yeah, and, and, and I'll say this, uh, John, to your point, you know, I don't mean we invent stuff. Like my development team will take, we just don't buy it off the shelf. We'll take, let's say we want to do a, a coaching. We want to teach performance coaching. Mm -hmm. well, what's, what's the best coaching theory? What's the most relevant right. best practice in that world? And we'll bring that in and then develop the actual learning experience around that best theory. And so, I think if if it's packaged when it's packaged for the private sector, I'm not sure it's always packaged in a way the public sector can use it because we do we do need have different needs. And so when I talk about not buying generic training, that's really what I'm talking about is making sure that it's built for the public sector learner. Your design principles in action, right there. No, that's it. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Person, the person. very good. Mm -hmm. Right. 
So, Dr. Holliday, you have great support, as you've described. Your your Chief Executive, Governor Haslam, is all in, and Commissioner Rebecca Hunter, who also we are just great fans of here at Governing for the work that she has done with you for the state of Tennessee. Um, as we look ahead, there are 36 administrations changing in the November 6th election. Um, mm-hmm. County commissioners and mm-hmm. mayors will yeah. have um, also a changeover. How do you how do you institutionalize this? How do you make it systemic and hand yeah. that baton, baton off after all of your hard work to the next administrations? Yeah, well, first let me say, I hope the next administration says, hey, let's keep Doc Holliday. Uh, yeah. So let me, just, <laughs> let me just say that. Um, and and I, I wouldn't mind them saying, hey, let's keep Rebecca Hunter, because sometimes, you know, you've got a subject matter expert that can really take someone's vision and help put it to play. But the sustainability factor for us when we think about this is that we've cascaded it down and it, it doesn't sit at the top. So we've actually got frontline employees, we've got that that frontline supervisor, that mid-level manager, the movement is happening there because we've created this passion for improvement and this passion for learning and bettering themselves. We are tracking our promotions in state government and we have we've been able to show through our metrics that people are getting better and more competitive in their roles and and really can compete for higher level positions because of the investment we're making internally. And so we have this whole philosophy, grow your own. And if we're going to grow our own people, then the morale is going to increase because people see us not just always going to the outside and bringing people in, but actually saying, wait a minute, we're going to invest in you. And if you have the desire, if you have the initiative, if you want to keep getting better, we're going to help you get better. And I think that's the sustainability piece is we've got a workforce now who's expecting to be developed. And so any new administration that comes in, I also think it's um, it's good business. So the, the more that you can make sure your workforce is learning and improving so that they can move your vision forward, the better off you'll be. And, and I think our data will tell that story to the new administration, which I just can't wait for for them to see because it's a story that still – There's so much more for us to do, and there's such a higher place where we can go, which I think that should excite any new administration coming in. And and I would encourage anybody at the local level to have that same kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. Dr. Holliday, I'd back that up as well. I mean, those are great internal stories that rev things up to get people excited. I would pose it's also an external story that could be used to attract and bring into government those people who are of that bent who can see not only is there an investment, but there's a payoff. And that payoff is an enhanced career. Uh, And and so that data capture and that telling, telling that data to then develop information and then that information generating the story that people can yeah. hear and see uh, just spot on. Yeah. 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 So it looks like we are closing in on just a few minutes left, and I have two questions that I really, really want to get to. Um, we have 16 in the queue, so I apologize to those that we are not going to get to. We will try to answer them um, as after the webinar, but the two questions are, first of all, we've, we've got kind of a theme among a couple of these questions on either an employee who has been in the job for quite some time and perhaps is not um, influencing those with the happiest of attitudes. And the second one is when, when there is low morale in an organization, how can you use this as a tool to turn that around and how can you involve every employee? Because they're your best recruiters. They're your best retainers. That's right. Uh, John, can you want me to take a stab first? Yeah, go ahead and I'll, I'll, I'll riff off. Okay, so, so we actually, we, we use the tool, an engagement survey that actually tells us, one, would your employees refer your department 
to a friend as an employer. And that statistic, I, we don't take that statistic lightly at all. And, and one of the things that I think that we have to really recognize is one, negativity is a disease. And, and if we as leaders do not set expectations and do not hold people accountable from behavior. I always say you cannot manage personality, but you can manage behavior. And you can say, you know what, this isn't working here. We're trying to create a positive culture. How could you help us do that? We really want you on board. What can you do to help add value and not take the negativity approach, but say, here's how I can contribute in a positive way. But we've got to have those kind of truthful conversations with employees who are really bringing down the hole because one bad apple will spoil the bunch. Mm -hmm. Absolutely agree. Everybody's mm -hmm. on the bus. And I think we need to make sure they understand what the rules are and what the expectations, just as they have theirs, organizations also have the expectations. And the culture needs to be open enough and transparent enough and honest enough to make sure that those are understood and that there are consequences. Yeah, and uh, Julia, this is, a, uh, yeah, this is a funny, this is just a funny end to that. Um, one of the things Commissioner Hunter taught me really early on, she goes, Trish, bring all your resistors to the table. And I'm like, no. And she's like, yes. <laughs> and I'm like, no. And she's like, yes. And so that's a hard phone call to make is to pick up the phone and invite your resistors to the table because it's like, oh, my gosh, you're inviting the negativity into the room. But she was so spot on because when they come into the meeting, you're asking them to be a part of something bigger, and they help say, here's what I'm not liking about it or here's how it doesn't work, but yet their voice is included in building it. I'm telling you, by the end, they are on board and change agents. I mean, so she, in her, in her own right, is brilliant in that way, but it works, even though it is the most difficult phone call to make. Mm -hmm. That's very, very tough. And just in three, just a quick lightning round for both of you, um, how do we work to bring awareness to careers in government? So what are your top, top recommendations? And then we're going to end the Q&A there. Quick lightning round for me is one yep. with government. You can be anything you want to be in government. There's all kinds of career opportunities. And the other thing with government is you can make a difference. And you can come to work every day and feel like you're contributing to a cause that is bettering the greater good. And I, and I think you just cannot diminish that aspect of it. Great. And I'll, John, I'll final take thought? off of that and say the final thought is Dr. Holliday talked about the what. I'll talk about the how. Utilize the technology that exists out there today, social media, any information anywhere, anytime by anybody. Have access to it. It's what the people have grown up with, and it's how you get their attention. That's how you, you know, get the word out. Message, well, I think it's that's right. You gotta get the word out. Fan fantastic. This is this hour has flown by as our audience knows because we are just a minute or two past. So thank you so much. As I said, um, everyone will get a copy of the slides and that toolkit's available by clicking on webinar resources widget on the bottom of the screen. On behalf of Governing, I really want to thank Dr. Trish Holiday and John Yamas. You two have been spectacular speakers. We've learned so much from you today. And a special thanks to Cornerstone for enabling us to bring this worthwhile discussion to our audience. Subscribe to Governing at governing.com, and you'll see uh, probably features by Trish in the future. And thanks again. We look forward to hearing and participating and seeing you at another governor Governing event soon. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.